Well, my name is Brittany Dunn. I'm a partner in the Fargo office of I Bailey, and I work on the tax side of the world, um, but specifically with dealerships, auto dealerships, and implements. Um, so I see many familiar faces or familiar names that is um, on this on this uh, webinar, and so I appreciate that. Good to see everyone, and some unfamiliar ones. Um, so I appreciate you guys joining in with us. Um, over the last few months, we've gotten. Um, in our in our dealership industry, our the partners that work there have gotten more and more questions on cybersecurity, and a lot of it has been related to these FTC safeguard rules and how this is going to apply to our industry. I think it kind of ran under the radar a little bit. Most of us um, don't think of ourselves as a financial institution, which is what these rules really apply to. But it's now been made clear that um, the FTC does consider some dealerships at least um, to fall under these rules and these rules are going to apply to all of us. Um, so we've got, you know, the next nine or so months to get, get our ducks in a row and um, be ready for that implementation. So we've been getting a lot of questions about, okay, what is it? What do we do? Things like that. Also been hearing more questions okay, from clients just about cybersecurity in general. And, and they've been running into questions from insurance as they've been doing their insurance renewals, they've been getting questions about what policies and procedures they have in place to protect themselves as insurers are wanting to quantify just how much risk they have as, they're, as they are writing those ins cybersecurity insurance policies. And I think it's become pretty um, apparent that cybersecurity is a, a protection that we need to have, um, especially as we've had a couple of good years in this industry, um, making us maybe even more of a target. So with those kind of questions coming in, we thought it would be a good time to um, have a webinar and get the conversation started. So we invited Michael Nugier, um, who is our practice leader in cybersecurity, um, to do this webinar as he has, lives and breathes these rules um, and has a lot of experience and has started to work with some of our dealership clients, mine and other partners. Um, and has some, I think, has really been able to help out um, those clients. He's spent about the last 15 to 20 years in this world of IT and cybersecurity, um, and, and most of it doing consulting. Oddly enough, he, in his past life before I Bailey, did do some consulting work for some of the manufacturers that we all, all um, deal with. Um, so he is somewhat familiar with them. Um, uh, with our industry and is learning more and more as he's worked with some of ours. And as he'll explain, um, these rules are maybe not dealership specific because they do apply to financial institutions, um, but he'll help us to understand how it's going to apply to us. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Michael um, and I'm going to sit back and, and learn as well um, about these new rules and, and what we need to do here to, to get ready to, to, to implement them. So take it away, Michael. Thanks, Brittany. A uh, great introduction, uh, probably one of the best I've ever had. So yeah, 15 to 20 years in IT and cybersecurity. Uh, and before that, I was just a kid with a computer um, trying to break things and figure out how they worked. And um, that led to the love of, of ethical hacking and uh, cybersecurity that I'm in now. So I, I guess today, uh, the, the FTC, what we'll talk about today is the, the FTC safeguard rules. And I, and I just want to answer some questions, the, the why, the, the who, and the what, what it all involves. And why are we talking about the, the FTC safeguard rules? And why are we considering dealerships, um, financial institutions, and uh, in, in imposing these rules? And so we'll, we'll touch directly on those uh, individually. And we'll start with the, the why. Before we get directly into the rules, this, this answers the why for me. Why is cybersecurity a focus for the FTC? Why is it a focus for any industry at this point? And I just went out to Google and I copied a whole bunch of just, I searched for cyber attacks in the United States. And these are just some of the headlines. You'll see some of the big ones, a lot of different industries in here, uh, Iowa Farm Cooperative, you see the, the re, uh, fast food and, and restaurant industry with McDonald's there, uh, some medical, right? It, Cybersecurity and cyber attacks are not industry focused. They do have industry um, specifications within them, but realistically, every computer that is connected to the internet is a target. Uh, every person accessing that computer is a target as well. And so you'll see uh, just the swath of industries covered from cyber attacks. We'll touch on what industries are hit the hardest before we get too far into this. Uh, but I wanted to just point out, right, in about 
15 or 20 seconds, I search Google for, for cyber attacks and you'll see some prices on here, some number of records lost, all of that. It, it's just telling of where we're at in, in this world. And, and we'll talk about some of those trends that we've seen or the statistics we've seen over the last several years. So cyber attacks have increased 61% since 2021. Um, that's a huge increase. It is now the fastest growing crime in the world. Uh, because of its ease of entry, right? Everything's more and more connected to the internet, right? We all have a laptop, a computer, a cell phone, a smart thermostat if you have one of those, cameras at your home, a fridge that connects to the internet, whatever it might be, kids' laptops, family members, devices, that just increases the attack surface from a cybersecurity perspective in IT. And so that's why you see this massive increase in cyber attacks year over year. We've all transitioned to work from home, or a lot of organizations and industries did over the last couple of years, and so that increased the cost of a breach by about $1 million. Um, when we talk about breaches inside of, an in, inside of an organization, it takes an average of 286 days, about three quarters of a year, to identify and um, contain, not even recover from that breach, just contain the breach. 200 of those days, an attacker is sitting in an environment unnoticed. Uh, the average cost of a breach increased about half a million dollars year over year from 2020 to 2021. And we're expecting to see that increase in 2022 as well, uh, once the year ends. Uh, and so worldwide, it was 4.2, four, four and a quarter million dollars per breach on average. Uh, what you will notice is that in the United States, it was about double. So you can imagine that the United States is highly targeted for our uh, high tech industries, uh, our, our massive use of technology for every business line, every industry that we have here, uh, and just the ease of entry here, right? There are nation state actors that don't have the same legal considerations and can hack the United States from across the world and in the comfort of their seat, uh, and very rarely do they get caught. I think the statistics are in the low single digits for prosecuted cyber attackers. On average, if a record is stolen from your organization in a data breach, it costs about $180. Now that, that increases more depending on what type of information was stolen. You can see a healthcare record being stolen is about $500 in a fine from any organization, from, from HIPAA in this case, right? The FTC can fine per record and that's an average of about $180 per record. Uh, what, we, what we point out to there is Equifax was hit. They were governed by the FTC. They were hit in 2017, I believe. Uh, they lost about half of the United States social security numbers and credit, credit records, right? They're currently negotiating with the FTC. I think they've landed somewhere in the 600 to $700 million range from a fine perspective for, for that number of records. So that's, that's a massive payout uh, that Equifax has to make as well. Uh, financial services, and I know everybody's like, I'm a dealership, I'm not financial services. We'll talk about what that correlation is here in a second and why the FTC considers it that. Financial services is the second highest cost per breach, making it probably the second most targeted um, industry as well uh, when it comes to cyber attacks. Uh, and here's just the, the receipt for that. This is a, a study put on by the Poneman Institute and IBM every year. They do the cost of a, of a breach study. Uh, and this can be just found with a simple Google. I can also send out a link to it if you're interested in the report. Um, healthcare comes in at the highest cost per breach, making um, the financial industry second, which is where dealerships lie uh, when it comes to the reporting for this. Um, you'll see, though, year over year, they actually dropped um, just a little bit in the cost per breach, which you can attribute to uh, being able to respond more effectively in the financial industry. It is more regulated when it comes to cybersecurity. Let's jump into the safeguard rules. Uh, I don't want to go too fast. And since this is supposed to be a round table, I wanted to present some data, but I also, if you have a pressing question, feel free to chat it across. You can interrupt me if you really feel compelled uh, and we can talk about it there. Why? Why is the FTC safeguard rule being imposed on dealerships? And, and uh, why does it even exist? Uh, and so it is, um, if you're familiar with GLBA, if everybody's in the accounting world in this, on this call, Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, 
Uh, it requires financial institutions to create administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. The GLBA applies to multiple industries. Uh, the FTC is working with GLBA uh, or under the GLBA to impose these safeguards to the financial industry. Um, the purpose of this is to protect customer and consumer data, right? There's a lot of trust in that. As a, as a consumer, I give my social security number, my credit information to organizations so that I can purchase things, get a new vehicle, buy a house, whatever it might be. In return, I'm expecting that that information is well protected because identity theft can cost me individually millions of dollars, and I don't really have a ton of insurance to cover that nowadays. Um, the FTC safeguard rule is also supposed to provide guidance to financial institutions, right? It's not just supposed to be a rule that you have to meet. It's supposed to provide guidance on what your security rules should look like. And it should improve the accountability of all financial institutions uh, in regards to their infosec programs, right? We wanna make sure that as things are happening, that there is accountability and visibility into that, uh, those, those victims of those cyber attacks. Uh, and what you'll see is periodic reports uh, to boards or governing bodies, senior leadership, whatever that might be. Uh, in this slide, if you have the handout, there is a link to the FTC rules. It's 48 pages. I read every page of it. Uh, realistically, you can focus on the last six pages or so. Uh, everything else is just comments of what's happened over the last year leading up to this um, implementation. Uh, what I want to point out here is the administrative, technical, and physical safeguards that are imposed that they're looking to for all organizations to hit and just talk about what administrative, physical, and technical safeguards are. Boiled down, administrative safeguards are actions, uh, guidance, policies, procedures, guidelines, whatever it might be, all the conceptual aspects of how you're going to do things and why you're going to do it, right? A policy is is answering why the procedures are how, right? And so it's those non-technical, right? You don't need software to perform these. It's just what's documented for our, our security moving forward. Physical brick and mortar security. Can I walk into your organization, grab a laptop and walk out? Is your data center well protected? Are there, are there certain security controls in place? That's what we're talking about when we, when we um, mention the physical security. Uh, and this is even more important as the last car dealership I went to, the, all of their sales staff is in the main room and all their computers just sit there. If they're not being uh, locked to, to a desk, can those walk out? If they're not being locked from a technical perspective, can I just walk up to a computer and start um, perusing data on that? Uh, and so what is the security on those workstations? If somebody walks away, do they automatically lock? Things along those lines. What physical barriers can we put into place? And then the technical security. How, how do people access this? What software um, do we have in place? What directory controls? How are we auditing them? Uh, what encryption are we using when we're sending sensitive information over email? Things along those lines. How are we preventing our organization from using their personal Gmail accounts to send sensitive information to their friends and family, whatever it might be? Those are the technical controls. Who? Who does the this FTC safeguard rule apply to? Um, starting January, and, and we'll get to the the, the dates. Starting in January, they they broaden they they made a broader scope for who this applies to right it was financial institutions and now they've put in and I put it in quotes because they just call them finders or companies that bring together buyers and sellers of products or services uh, it's a very basic definition in there and I put below how they reference automobile dealerships uh, this rule only applies to organizations that have more than 5,000 or 4,999 4, consumers. So you need 5,000 consumers or more for this rule to apply to you. Below that number, they're highly recommended. Uh, I personally would recommend cybersecurity regardless of the size of your organization, uh, but you have to do something that's scalable for your size as well. Uh, and so the FTC defined um, automobile dealerships. They pointed it out in this, this link that I have listed here. Um, as, a usable, uh, as a usual part of their business, they lease automobiles on a non-operating basis for longer than 90 days. Most dealerships that I've, I've worked with and been to do leasing for three years, one year, two year, right? Whatever that might be for a number of miles. Um, and so that's, that's really the definition, right? Is, is if you have a leasing program, if you're doing financing of vehicles, 
uh, within your organization and you have more than 5,000 customers in your program. We'll talk about the statutes of limitations on that 5,000 customers moving forward. What is the safeguard rule? We answered why they're putting it into place. We wanna see that accountability. We wanna see, uh, we wanna protect our consumers. Uh, and that's very important as 86% of consumers in the dealership industry surveyed stated that they would not reuse a dealership that had lost their information in a cybersecurity breach. Uh, that's a huge issue when it comes to brand image, brand damage, uh, and customer loyalty. Uh, so the safeguard rules went into effect January 10th, uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, and they have to be implemented by December 9th of 2022. And I know I'll get the question, what happens if they're not implemented December 9th of 2022? Probably nothing. But after December 9th of 2022, if you experience a cybersecurity breach that you have to report to the FTC, because that is a part of this, and you have to, you have to do some sort of public uh, relations around a breach, if you do not have the correct implementation of these controls in place and you are audited by the FTC for that, they can fine you. They have to prove negligence, right? You haven't put any of these rules in place. You purposefully didn't put them in place. You haven't been working towards them. Things along those lines. Um, and there's no set number of what that fine looks like, but they have the capability of, per, of um, implementing some form of penalty after that point uh, in relation to these rules. What are the rules? Uh, you have to develop, implement, and manage an information security program. They boil it up to that. It's the first paragraph of Rule 314.1 uh, in the FTC um, release in the link below. Uh, and what? And then they go further than that, and they outline what that looks like. And they they have nine different points, right? You have to have a qualified individual responsible for your information security program. You have to perform periodic risk assessments. You have to implement safeguards to mitigate risks identified from the risk assessment, test and monitor your safeguards, implement policies and procedures, oversee service providers. I'm literally reading off the slide here, adjust information security program, um, and, and that's based on your testing and monitoring of those safeguards, establish an incident response plan, and then your qualified individual has to report to a board, senior leadership, or some governing body that is over, overseeing your organization. Um, and they call can that. Can I ask a question? Can I yes. ask a question? Go for it. Um, and, I, and you can say if you're going to talk about this later, but just kind of thinking back to um, who, who it applies to on the dealership side, you specifically had said 5,000 consumers, but then you had talked about having leases. Do you just have to be selling? Is it just leases or any, any financial transactions where you're lining up a loan, um, selling that sort of product? I, is that, does that matter too? Because I'm just thinking if it's they're actually, the dealership is actually um, owning the vehicle and administering the lease, that's maybe not 5,000 for some, but there's maybe 5,000 leases sold or financing products sold. Right, it's just 5,000 consumers that you're pulling in credit information for. So if you are financing a vehicle, leasing a vehicle, whatever it might be, if you're pulling in that information, it is the scope of it is just those 5,000 consumers. You might sell, 50,000 cars, but 49,000 of those might be cash transactions. So there's no credit information needed to, to some extent, right? And so the scope is applied to just the financing and leasing. Um, so if you're pulling financial information in to get them approved for a yes. financial loan or something, that counts. Okay, thank you. Yes. And we are going to touch on that a little bit more. Uh, and so we're going to walk through these one through nine. Uh, and I do want to leave uh, some more space for questions to be answered, but hopefully I, I am able to provide enough information uh, through this. Uh, and I'm happy to have a conversation after the fact too. I know people don't like to speak up on webinars. Uh, and so if you have questions, my contact information will be at the end of this slide deck. Uh, and we can, I, I might've forgot to put Brittany's in there, but we can throw Brittany's in as well if you have questions too. Uh, so what does it mean to designate a qualified individual? They outline this and define it, um, relatively loosely uh, in, the, in the safeguards. This person needs to be responsible for the implementation and oversight of the InfoSec program. They don't define qualified very well, but the person does have to have a, an IT and security background in order to be considered qualified 
Uh, they do specify it in number seven, I believe, as we get there, of what that looks like, uh, periodic training and review for their security um, knowledge. So we'll get to that. Um, they need to, they can be a full-time employee within your organization. They can be an affiliate or a service provider. So a third party uh, consultant, whatever it might be. Um, it can be that as well. If you go that route, the affiliate and service providers must comply to the safeguard rules. So they need senior leadership oversight from your organization. They need to report to um, the C-suite or board to some extent um, so that what they're doing has the the top-down approach of, of effectiveness, um, right? The service provider, like I said, also has to maintain the safeguard compliance, um, not just be secure, but, uh, but hit the specific points that we're talking about um, moving forward. So that qualified individual, it needs to be one person. It does not need to be a full-time employee. It can be a current employee, an IT employee. It can be, um, it can be, a salesperson, as long as that person has qualifications from a cybersecurity perspective. So making sure that that is, that is in line, right? You don't want to just appoint some random person to be in charge of this, or that could, uh, you could be found in non-compliance. Um, when you are using a third party, uh, there are a lot of cost savings for using an affiliate or service provider, because you don't necessarily have to hire a full-time employee. It can be somebody that that has a handful of hours a month to pay attention to this um, and, and make sure that things are aligning with the information security program. Uh, risk assessments need to be performed. Uh, you need to identify, the risk assessment needs to identify internal and external risks to the customer information in scope, which is the financial information that you are pulling from customers. Um, you need to reasonably identify foreseeable risks Right, which is why a qualified individual is, is required for the risk assessment or a third party performing the risk assessment as well, because they have the knowledge of the industry, what's happening uh, within cybersecurity to, to understand what those foreseeable risks are. Um, the risk results, the risk has to result in disclosure, misuse, alteration, um, uh, lack of destruction of data, something we need to, the, the risks need to be associated with that customer information that you're pulling. Um, and it needs to ass assess the sufficiency of all the current safeguards that we're gonna talk about moving forward, including the qualified individual. So the qualified individual can self-assess themselves and the organization can self-assess themselves as well. Um, it, it might not be right, you, not, you don't necessarily hire an auditor from internally to, to test your organization, right? Right. If you're building a house, you don't want to just test your own walls. You want to make sure you're bringing in somebody to do that. And that usually that usually leads to a stronger, better foundation uh, within, uh, within the risk assessment. It does need to be documented. This can't just be a PowerPoint presentation. It has to be put on paper uh, and it has to include categor categorization and prioritization of the risk. Uh, it has to assess the CIA triad. And uh, a lot of you are wondering what that is, and that'll be the next slide. So we'll talk about that moving forward. Uh, and the risk mitigation and acceptance requirements um, need to be listed in there in the in the in the documented plan as it's related to the information security program. So what mitigation there can be, and what acceptance of risk the organization is going to move forward with needs to be documented as well. Um, and you do have to periodically. Uh, assess at least annually, um, unless there is a major change to the organization. You change your your DMS, you add another location, whatever that might be. Then another risk assessment needs to take place for that scope, right? For the new DMS, for the new the new locations that you're acquiring, whatever it might be. Uh, what is the CIA triad? Um, we love our acronyms in cybersecurity. We have a million of them, and I know every one of them, and nobody else knows them. So CIA stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. It are the, it's the three uh, founding principles for protecting data and systems, right? Uh, a system or data needs to be kept confidential, right? It needs to be kept secret, and it needs to be controlled who can access that, right? There needs to be integrity in the data. It needs to be trustworthy, 
If that data can be changed and nobody knows about that change to that data, then there is no trustworthiness in that data. There's no integrity. Uh, and so uh, if there's no integrity, then we can't consider that data uh, a valuable resource. Data, by the way, is the most valuable resource in the world. It surpassed oil a couple of years ago. Um, and so that's why we have these fun triangles, um, right? Is the data authentic? Is it accurate? And is it reliable? Might not be the most important thing inside of a dealership, uh, the dealership and financial industry, except for people's money needs to be accurate, right? It needs to be reliable. It needs to be authentic. This means a lot more in the healthcare industry. If you're bringing in data pre-surgery to something and it has been modified without knowledge, that can lead to some severe implications. Same from a financial perspective as well uh, within any other in industry. Uh, and then if the data is kept secret and we are sure that it is trustworthy, it doesn't mean anything if we can't access it, if it's not available. And it has to be available in a timely manner. It can't just be available over time. I think back to when I was a kid and I had to dial in to my internet and it made all those funny noises that I'm not gonna to replicate on this call because I don't want people laughing at me. Um, right, it, it took a long time to get to a web page, so much so that as speed increased, that technology dwindled away. Nobody's really dialing in anymore to their internet because it doesn't make sense nowadays. And so the timeliness is very important. And that comes into play when you are selling a car, or leasing a car, financing a car, uh, or you're a doctor or you're in any industry, right? If your order doesn't come across at the restaurant in a timely manner, you're going to be upset. You don't want to sit at a restaurant for an hour while you're hungry. If you can't get the correct uh, allergies as a doctor, pre-surgery or during an evaluation of a patient, uh, you might not make the right decision when prescribing them some form of um, medication. And then in the dealership and automobile industry, right? If you can't access the features on a vehicle, that person might go somewhere else. If you can't access the correct pricing, the correct interest rates, whatever it might be, if that data is not available for you to get in a, in a timely manner, uh, then you might be out of customer you might be out uh, more than that as well. So that's the CIA triad and that's why we need to assess that. Is your data, are your systems kept confidential? Is there integrity in that, uh, in that data? And is it readily available to the right people um, when it needs to be? Design and implementation of, of uh, design and implement the safeguards. So the qualified individual that you put into place has to design safeguards related to the following bullet points. Access control. Who can access the data, your data? Who can access your building? When can they access your building? Um, the, the concepts we want to employ around access control are least privileged. Oftentimes, as, as new people start in organizations, a lot of people just give them everything because they don't want to deal with managing what they should have access to. It can take a lot of work. Uh, in the cybersecurity industry, we have this principle called least privileged access, right? We wanna make sure that people get access to exactly what they need and nothing more. Uh, at that point, you start to lose confidentiality and in potentially integrity to data and maybe even availability if somebody can delete it. And so the, the concept of least privileged from an access control perspective, and that's not just technical, it's also physical. Right? We don't want to give somebody the main key to our building that only needs to be there eight to five, Monday through Friday. Um, and likewise, we don't want to give somebody a key to our building for weekend work or whatever it might be unless they absolutely need it. Uh, and it has gone through an approval process. Uh, and so you have to define best practices around access control. There are best practices. I didn't bring those into this slide deck because I wanted to make sure to honor your time and answer any questions. Uh, but I do have some recorded webinars on our Ad Bailey website that go through what access control best practices are. Uh, and I'm happy to have those conversations as well. Asset management. You don't know how to protect what you don't know you have, right? Uh, there's probably a better way of saying that, but asset management is very important. You need to know what data you have, what people you have, what devices you have, what systems you have, and what facilities you have. If that is not well documented, and clearly understood for the qualified individual, then you can't protect it. I didn't know we had 16 extra laptops plugged in to um, Chad and HR's house uh, and always on Wi-Fi. I can't protect those if I don't know about them. Asset management is, is really the keystone to 
a cybersecurity program. You need to know what you have in order to protect it. Data management and encryption. What is happening to our data uh, as it sits on people's computers? Are they allowed to take that data on a flash drive or email it to their personal accounts? Um, that, that can cause a lot of right, integrity issues and confidentiality issues when it comes to the CIA triad. And then how do we send confidential information from our business to a third party that needs it? Uh, how are we encrypting it? How are we making it look like gobbledygook when it comes across in an email, except for the right party to see it, right? As a hacker um, and, and an ethical one, we perform what's called a man in the middle attack where we monitor what you're sending from your computer to somebody else's computer, right? And if it's not encrypted, we can take that data and then we have full access to it. If it's encrypted, it means nothing to me, right? It's just a whole bunch of symbols and letters. If everybody knows what wingdings is, it looks just like that. Right? There's like a little triangle here and a circle there with a dot in the middle of it, whatever it might be. Doesn't make sense to me. And I'm probably not gonna waste my time as a hacker uh, decrypting that because there's probably something somewhere else that's easier target for me. So how are we encrypting it? Are you sending customer financial information from an email at your organization to an email at another organization? Are you sending it through a secure file share instead? Are you sending it through an email encryption service? Those are all considerations and need to be implemented as a part of these safeguards, specifically for that customer financial information. If you are developing your own software, and this has happened in some organizations in the dealership uh, industry, um, you have to employ secure software development practices. I'm not gonna dive into this too much because a lot of a lot of dealerships are utilizing third parties to do this, right? You're, you're going through um, a DMS company to provide that rather than building your own DMS. It doesn't make sense at this point to build your own for the most part. So uh, if you are developing your own software inside of your organization to do specific things, making sure that you're, you have a security first approach to that. There are standards within this. I'm not gonna dive into those, um, but I'm happy to talk about those after the fact. Everybody loves multi-factor authentication. It's the most inconvenient part of our day half the time when you're waiting for that text message of six digits to come through, or you have to get your cell phone out and you have to make sure that you get into your cell phone and find those six digits or press a button to approve it. It can be really inconvenient. It is also probably the number one thing that can stop a cyber attack um, from an authentication perspective, from somebody getting into your email or logging into a specific system to steal data. Multi-factor authentication is just one other way that you can thwart cyber attackers. Uh, and it is a requirement under the safeguards. This is a two point slide, because uh, there is a lot to consider. How are we destroying data uh, and our customer information, specifically the financial information that is in scope from the FTC? Um, it has to be securely destroyed. You can't just throw an old computer away that has customer records on it. You have to wipe that hard drive. Um, you do have to maintain two years of records for each individual customer from the point that they start to the point that they have not um, done business with you, right? Two years from that point. So if you have a customer that keeps coming in year after year and filling out finance forms, uh, loan docs, whatever it might be, they're giving you their information again and again and again, you have to maintain it two years from that point. After that, you can destroy it and securely so. And I would recommend doing so because holding on to records for a really long time uh, opens you up to a little bit more risk. Um, the only time that, that the safeguard rules want you to keep data longer than two years is if it is pivotal to the, your business's success, right? They don't really clearly define that but if, if, it, if it leads to the success of your organization moving forward, keeping that financial data, um, and you can justify that, then you can keep it longer than two years. Uh, each organization that falls under the, the FTC safeguards needs to adopt a change management program. That means that anytime something is changed at your organization, it has to be considered from a security perspective, right? We wanna add a new location. Okay, how are we performing change management to do that? How are we considering security as a part of that new location? We want to implement a new DMS. We want to implement a new um, customer management uh, website. Whatever it might be, change management has to be the consideration there. How is this going to implement into our organization and what considerations do we need to make from a security perspective? 
You also have to monitor your environment. You have to implement policies, procedures, and controls for that monitoring. What are the processes that we have to do when we're monitoring it? And this is, this is tightly scoped around customer data. So who is accessing your customer data? Uh, who is accessing systems that your customer data is on? And are there any anomalies around that? How are you monitoring those anomalies? Is somebody trying to log in to your uh, finance system and they keep entering the wrong password five times, 10 times, 20 times, right? That is when we start to consider a, that a brute force attack. It's a security event that needs to be investigated. Are you able to do that currently? Um, and in a lot of organizations, that's, that can seem like a very hard thing to do, but there are really easy ways to implement that. Um, and so um, system monitoring, uh, sounds intense, but actually it's not that hard to do because you can set limits uh, for the anomalies, right? If somebody enters their password wrong once, you don't necessarily, necessarily need to be aware of that. If somebody enters their password wrong 10 times from a computer in Russia, you probably want to be concerned about that and notified of that so that you can shut it down and block that person from accessing your system. Test and monitor your safeguards. Once you have your safeguards in, in place and once as you're implementing them, test and monitor them. You wanna make sure that they are effective, right? You wanna make sure that you can't break them or a third party can't break them uh, from an ethical hacking perspective. You also wanna test the procedures, see if there's any gaps in those procedures. And that's a periodic thing, right? Exercising those procedures, making sure that, that right, if, if um, employee X in the IT department wins the lotto and quits without notice that there's still continuity in that and resiliency in that. Um, you also have to employ either continuous monitoring of your environment's vulnerabilities or perform a periodic pen test and a vulnerability assessment. Uh, a penetration test is hiring an ethical hacker to come into your environment, uh, somebody like myself, to perform ethical attacks against your environment to show you what is effective from uh, a real world example, right? Uh, an annual penetration test is required um, in, in, from the FTC for the safeguard rules. Uh, you can perform those internally as well, or you can hire somebody outside to perform those. And then twice yearly vulnerability assessments. Uh, so every six months, uh, you need to perform a, a vulnerability assessment, which is just to identify the vulnerabilities that are in your environment and to validate that they do actually exist. Very easy, quick things to do. Um, you also have to perform both tests after any material changes, adding another location, adding a new um, software to your environment. And I'm not talking about like an install on one computer, I'm talking about a major implementation of a new dealer management system or something along those lines. Then you would need to perform another uh, penetration test and vulnerability assessment focused on that scope, uh, on those, those new implementations. Implement policies and procedures. This is probably um, one of the most important things you can do to create the program within your environment. It doesn't exist until it's documented and that's what policies and procedures do, right? You build policies for your personnel uh, from an acceptable use perspective. Can they use their cell phone to take a picture of a driver's license so that they can do a test drive? That should probably, the answer to that is absolutely no, right? I, I am willing to bet that a lot of organizations, a lot of dealerships on this call still have that process in place because the quicker you can move, the quicker you can get the sale. And that's very important in this industry because um, cars are not, not, uh, not always there. So, right, what, what policies do you have? Can they use their personal devices to take uh, personally, identifiable, uh, personally identifiable, uh, identifiable information down? That's really hard to say. Um, do they have access to corporate data on their cell phones, right? What's acceptable to use? What procedures should they be using if they need to take somebody's driver's license and insurance information for a test drive? Do they need to walk all the way back in? Or is there an application that we can use on our cell phones that mitigates the risk of taking a picture with your cell phone? There are um, a lot of those. You need to have security awareness, training, and education. They specifically call this out in the safeguards. Um, it needs to be focused on the industry and the risks. And then you need to test it with phishing emails um, to see how effective that training actually is. 
you need to train your qualified individuals and then you need to verify that training and provide ongoing knowledge increase for your qualified individuals via certifications or continuing professional education, social engineering testing, like I said, phishing emails. Uh, I did include some example policies from an organization called SANS and I'm running out of time from a questions perspective. So I'm gonna try and make sure that I hit these next slides well, but quickly. Um, you need to oversee your third parties. What are you outsourcing to from an IT perspective, right? They also need to hit the, the FTC safeguards. So your DMS, your CRM, your enterprise resource manager, whatever these might be, any third parties that you're contracting out to that have access to that customer data that is financially related need to apply these FTC safeguards. And if they don't, you are liable for making sure that they do or you should not contract with them. That is essentially what the FTC is saying. Um, and it needs to be a part of your contract with them. So if you, as you're assigning new business accountability agreements, new contracts with organizations, uh, there needs to be specific language in there that requires them to maintain the FTC safeguards. Uh, and then you need to periodically assess your service providers as you're renewing your contracts with them, make sure that they do actually implement those FTC safeguards. They should be able to provide you an attestation report or some form of document that states that they are in alignment with those, those requirements. Um, adjust your information security program. This is a quick one. This is basically saying is that as material changes happen, you have to retest your environment uh, that is in scope from a financial information perspective. And then number eight, um, you need to build an incident response program in your environment. What happens if there is a security event, an incident, or a breach? Are you able to respond to it? The plan needs to include goals, so timelines, outcomes, right? How quickly should, do we want to respond to this? What should the outcome of this be um, uh, for specific situations? Internal processes for responding. You need to define the roles and responsibilities. A lot of people look at this as a technical document uh, or plan, but it really needs to include your human resources department, your legal team, your C-suite, your board. Everybody needs to be in there uh, in order for this to effectively run. Uh, you need to define how you're going to communicate and share information. You don't want everybody in your organization posting this on social media. You want to make sure that you're controlling those communications and what the plan is for doing that. Um, what are the requirements for remediation, right? Do you want to have a remediation plan or do you just want to um, stop the bleeding and move, move forward from that point? Uh, documentation and reporting of the security events and all activities that took place, that's vital as you experience a data breach because the FTC is gonna to wanna to see that. Gonna to wanna to know what you did and how you did it and what happened in your environment. And then a lessons learned, how can you improve the plan as you experience security events, security incidences and security breaches? Uh, IBM and Poneman Institute did state that if you are prepared and test your plan on a periodic basis, organizations saw the total cost of a breach uh, which was 4.24 million was about two and a half million dollars less because they were able to respond effectively quicker and better in preventing any further damage and mitigating any risk with that. So uh, very important um, that you have this built and tested out. Um, I can hear my dad in the back of my head saying, failing to plan is planning to fail, Michael. And that's one of those situations where this is vitally important. Uh, and then last but not least, before we get to questions, the qualified individual needs to be able to report to the board of directors or whatever governing body is over your organization. If there is no governing body, if it is um, a sole proprietorship of some sorts, right, and just the head of the organization is the C-suite, uh, then that is where they need to report to as well. So the, um, the, that governing body. Uh, it needs to be a written report and it needs to happen at least annually. That qualified individual needs to report on the overall status and compliance to the FTC rules um, from the information security program that they built. Um, any material matters, they use the term material, any major changes within the organization or major matters. So uh, any key points from the risk assessment, uh, any risk management or control decisions, accepting major risks, uh, mitigating major risks. Uh, the need to report on the compliance of all service provider arrangements, business accountability agreements and contracts that were signed. Um, they need to report high level on the rules from any of the testing that was completed. 
Um, obviously, this does not need to be a super technical document, but understanding how many critical vulnerabilities existed versus um, what those were is not important. Um, any events or violations and then management's response to that. So was there a security incident and how did management respond? Uh, and then any recommendations for changes. Um, I prefer doing these at least twice per year so that there is more, um, uh, more ability to change, right? Annually does not give the qualified uh, individual a lot of opportunity to report and make uh, incremental changes. Uh, those are all nine of the things that the FTC safeguard rules uh, are looking for from an information security program uh, and that they are gonna start requiring. Again, this is all due um, or compliance needs to be hit by December 9th. Uh, and so I went a little over, but I still have room for questions if anybody has questions. I have a couple. So back to earlier when Brittany had asked that question. Um, so if you have 4,999, um, would that be customers or would that be uh, credit pulls? Would it be all of the above? Um, and what is the time period that is to take place during that would put you under or put you over? So it is that two year requirement for holding data, right? You shouldn't be holding customer financial data for more than two years unless it is imperative to your business success. And if it's 4,999 within that two year period, and that data is specific to customer financial information or personally identifiable financial information. Like I said, we have an acronym for everything. So it's PIFI, P-I-F-I. -I. Um, and so if you are connect, collecting social security numbers, uh, addresses, credit card information, nah, credit card information is more in the PCI realm. So mainly social security information in regards to credit checking um, for financial information. Okay, so if you've got federal regulation, let's say for um, odometer disclosure of five years, then, then that would supersede this basically because you have to keep those documents and those records, correct? So then it would expand it to that period of time. Is it still just the, the most recent two year period? I mean, cause they would be kept. Right, it's if you have that data on your network and you are keeping that data, then you are, then yes, it is considered a record at that point. So if you have greater, requirements for data storage, then you have to, then that is still on your network and you are still required to hit the FTC safeguards for that. Okay, um, okay, that sounds good. Tell me about the multi-factor authentic uh, authentication um, requirements again. So um, every person, every computer will, it is, will be required that every computer, every person that has access to any of that data will have to have that tied to their, their cell phones. Are those cell phones, can they be personal cell phones or do they have to be company cell phones? So it doesn't necessarily have to be a cell phone. It can be a personal cell phone and it can be a company cell phone. It can be either of those. Uh, Multi-factor authentication just wants two of three factors, something you have, something you know, and something you are. So something you know is your password. Um, something you have is a cell phone or maybe a USB key that can authenticate as a secondary authentication. Uh, and something you are, it can be your eye, right? Your face on your cell phone, your fingerprint, whatever it is. And so it just has to be two of those. It only has to be on the resources that uh, are publicly accessible. Uh, as a part of the FTC safeguard rules. So they don't have to necessarily have it to log into their computer, but if they can log into their email remotely, that should have multi-factor authentication on it. Anything but that, oh, go ahead. Security questions are still considered uh, a re within that um, list of things that can happen. Technically they are, right? If they enter their password and then it takes them to answer, right? What, what your mother's made a name, right? Um, from a security best practices perspective, right? While that does check the box for multi-factor authentication, it is the least secure method. Okay. Um, because that information is easily accessible either from a phone call to that person or um, perusing their social media, for instance, so. Okay. Um, 
how do you hire, how do you find a tracker person, hacker person to come in and hack your system to see the risks? Yeah, absolutely. You can, uh, right, that's a, that's a great question, right? You can go to Google, right? iBailey is able to help perform those services for you as well. And so you can start with us. If you want variety, right, there is, um, there are um, other organizations out there that do perform that. We have industry expertise in the dealership industry and in the influence industry as well. And so uh, we're able to do that. And, um, but yes, there are a handful. And that's when I say handful, probably thousands of organizations out there that can do that. Um, and right, I wanna, I wanna be fair, searching Google for penetration testing services, something like that uh, can, can be your first lead. You're gonna get a lot of, uh, a lot of results. And so you can actually just, uh, I'll put up my information here. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to me. I can provide at least a proposal for what that would look like. Okay. And then the last question that I had was um, not necessarily something you covered today, but something I've been told in the past. So um, if a person owns a dealership and the software company that they use to do all of the paperwork um, including, okay, for, so that software company, in addition to, or um, also a company like a subprime lender, if those companies that, those vendors that you use have all of those things in place that the dealership doesn't have to necessarily comply on its own because they're using those companies that encrypt the, that data. What is your answer to that? Though I know, I probably know what you're going to say. I guess I just want to hear it from somebody who isn't a representative of those, those other vendors. Right. I, I guess my, 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 mo, my best practice answer would be if you have a third party requirement for people to hit specific standards, it's easiest to employ those across all your vendors and it's a best practice to do so, right? You don't want different security standards across the board because all third parties present a risk to your organization. Um, if they are not directly related to the scope of financial information that the FTC is looking to uh, protect, then there's not a, a hard and fast requirement. And I can't, I can't tell you exactly because I'd, I'd need to really dive into what that third party does and what their level of access is to your data before I can make a real good answer on that. But if it's not within the scope of that financial information, the personally identifiable financial information um, of your consumers, then, uh, then there would not be a technical requirement for them to impose those safeguard rules. Okay. I may need to take that offline later, um, some specific examples, but people are chatting up questions. I don't wanna take all that time. So thank you very much. I'll go ahead and address these two real quick. Does the continuous monitoring only apply to monitoring vulnerabilities or are there more areas that need to be monitored continuously? Uh, from a best practices standpoint, there's always more areas that need to be monitored continuously. Um, where did I put that one? Um, here we go. Uh, so the continuous monitoring as they stated um, is really monitoring the key controls, systems, and procedures within your environment. So it is more than vulnerabilities. It does not necessarily um, like a manage, detect, and response, but that would help hit this goal, right? There's, there's a, um, an ambiguity in the rule here. Um, and when you are testing, when you are doing a penetration test, you are testing key systems, key controls and procedures. And so that does help hit that. But continuous monitoring is not just a vulnerability management solution that is scanning your computers or an agent on them that is scanning the vulnerabilities daily. It has to expand beyond that for the procedures as well that are taking place with that. Uh, hopefully that, that answered your question. Uh, if not, feel free to chat um, uh, a follow-up. Um, then we have a, a question here. 
uh, basically stating um, I'm a very industry focused car dealership that doesn't have 5,000 consumers. Technically, based on the rule, you are exempt if you do not maintain financial information for more than 5,000 consumers, yes. According to this rule, and it is the very, it is a, it is a one sentence ex exemption at the end of all of this that basically says if you have less than 5,000 consumers of financial information, then you are exempt from this rule. So it, it might always be worthwhile to have uh, a security organization come in and do an, an assessment just to validate that you, you don't have to comply with that uh, as well. But if you're very certain that you don't have 5,000 um, users, then you should be exempt from that rule. Um, we do have about a minute and a half left of the hour. I uh, will put my information back up here. If you do have follow-on questions, you can email me, you can call me. That is my cell phone number, so feel free to call me on there. Um, happy to answer um, if I'm available. Uh, email is another great way to get a hold of me, and I respond relatively quickly as well. And Michael, if, if I could um, I have one more thing. Hi, everybody. I'm a manager in our cybersecurity group. Um, the, the question around being less than 5,000 consumers, well, for the purposes of this, I think is, is exempt. Um, we're not the only ones looking at these rulings. Um, the cybersecurity attackers also know who gets exempt from these rules. And as time goes on, we, we've seen them shift their focuses into exempt um, groups of, of companies to, to start attacking because they know that it's easier to get in that way. So just because you may be exempt at this point does not mean that it's necessarily something you can avoid or, or ignore. And can I restate why the word leasing was mentioned earlier in the course of business? Yes. Um, the amended rules from the safeguard that just came out, um, there is a link inside of the presentation um, that talks about what, uh, what the scope of that is. Uh, and so it's basically any financial transactions that you're doing that require credit checking um, of an organization. So this is the, the entirety of the, uh, the organization. And so it goes into a scope from an automobile dealership's perspective. I'm not going to search it on here. Um, basically, it, it ties into... Um, this slide right here, where it, it uses the term uh, leases automobiles as a, from a non-operating basis. Um, what that means and how to interpret that is, is really beyond my scope. I'm not, I'm not an attorney. I don't, uh, I don't dive into those specifically, but um, right, it's, it's really the, the financial activity that's taking place when you are performing leases or financing vehicles uh, within there. And so if you're doing more than 5,000 customers or consumers with this, it does bring this into scope. And there's always right, a follow-on where we can dive deeper into this and understand what the business looks like. Uh, if you're interested, uh, feel free to reach out. And that does bring us to the top of the hour. Uh, again, if you do have any follow-on questions, my information is right here. And I'm performing a, a presentation no-no of sharing my a whole slide deck screen, but uh, feel free to, again, reach out to me if you have any questions. Happy to answer those uh, at any point. I usually get back within the first 24 hours. So uh, thank you for joining uh, and um, have a great rest of your week. Happy Monday.